Carl Sagan's famous words, we are star stuff, refers to a mind-blowing idea that most atomic nuclei in our bodies were created in the nuclear furnaces and explosive deaths of stars that lived in the ancient universe. In recent years, it's become clear that the truth is even more mind-blowing. Many of Earth's heavy elements, including most precious metals, were produced in an even more spectacular event, the collision of neutron stars. When I was in astrophysicist school, they taught us that all the elements of the periodic table between carbon and iron were produced in onion shells by nuclear fusion in the cores of very massive stars during the last phases of their lives, and that elements heavier than iron were synthesized in the following supernova explosion. That latter process is well understood. The star's dead core collapses and protons are converted to neutrons. The surrounding shells ricochet outwards along with a layer of the iron and nickel core. The latter is blasted by a wave of neutrons which get rammed into the escaping nuclei. Some of those captured neutrons convert back to protons and so elements all the way up the periodic table can be made. This is the rapid neutron capture or R process. The rapid part is because neutrons are captured faster than nuclei can decay, making it possible to build very heavy nuclei. It's a cool story. It'd be cooler if it were true. So the R process is real and must happen to some extent in supernovae, but there are some details that this story misses. For one thing, the R process only produces the heaviest isotopes. Remember that element type, location on the periodic table, is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. Neutron number is variable and defines the isotope of the element. The R process produces only neutron-rich isotopes of most heavy elements. Neutron-poor isotopes are likely made by the slow neutron capture, or S process, inside lower mass stars. And actually, it turns out that even the heavy R process isotopes are probably not made in supernovae. Given the rate at which supernovae go off in the Milky Way, the interstellar medium should have way more R process elements than it appears to. In addition, models of supernova explosions have trouble producing the right conditions for substantial release of R process elements. The only modern nearby supernova, 1987A, appeared to have no enhanced enrichment in R process elements. R process elements exist, but their source doesn't seem to be supernova explosions. One of the proposed alternatives shot to prominence last year when the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories spotted the space-time ripples from the merger of a pair of neutron stars. Many of the world's great telescopes monitored the subsequent electromagnetic flash. As the ejected material from this collision expanded and faded, the spectral signatures of many R process elements were seen in abundance. Neutron star merger is now the leading candidate for the production of most of these elements, including those here on Earth. The process is suitably awesome. Let's take a look. Like I said, neutron stars are the dead cores of massive stars. They are composed almost entirely of neutrons at densities similar to the atomic nucleus. They also have a thin crust of iron. Densities are so high, in fact, that they are on the verge of complete gravitational collapse into black holes. So, take a pair of neutron stars in binary orbit, perhaps twin remnants of a once binary pair of massive stars. They slowly spiral towards each other as gravitational radiation saps their orbital energy. In the last minute before merger, that radiation is so strong that it'll be detected by an as yet unborn civilization 100 million light years away, as will the explosion of electromagnetic radiation that immediately follows as the neutron stars plow into each other. At the instant of this collision, the outer layers of the stars splash into a maelstrom of neutrons and iron in orbit around the merging neutron star interiors. That combined core has almost certainly pushed beyond the limits of gravity and collapses into a black hole within milliseconds. In the meantime, the surrounding vortex undergoes some crazy transformations. Prior to collision, the star's neutrons were stabilized by extreme pressure but once released, this nuclear goop expands and destabilizes. It breaks up into droplets of neutrons, 
many neutrons rapidly undergo beta decay, transforming into a proton after ejecting an electron and a neutrino. The droplets are now essentially nuclei, albeit hopelessly unstable ones. They break apart and beta decay into semi-stable elements. Meanwhile, the inner part of the vortex is still bathed in a sea of neutrons. The R process begins. Newly formed nuclei and older iron nuclei absorb neutrons, and so heavier and heavier elements are created as beta decay transforms some of the absorbed neutrons into protons. Some of these heavy elements are sprayed into the surrounding space by the energy of the collision itself, but most remain trapped in the intense gravitational field of the newly formed black hole, presumably doomed to fall into the event horizon. But that same beta decay process, the converted neutrons back to protons, also provides the mechanism for their escape. The beta decay releases both electrons and neutrinos, in fact, a wind of neutrinos so intense that it drives material outwards. We tend to think of neutrinos as ghostly particles that barely interact with matter, but here, both the neutrino and matter densities are so high that our new nucleons can ride this neutrino wind to freedom. Our best calculations suggest that neutron star collisions should be much better than supernovae at producing heavy elements and getting them out into the galaxy. Now that we've spotted these elements around the site of a neutron star collision, the story is looking better and better. A recent Nature paper by Marker and Bartos has clarified the origin of Earth's heavy elements even further. In fact, they figured out that some of our R process elements were formed in a single nearby neutron star collision around 80 million years before the formation of the solar system. Now, it'd be fair to ask how on Earth anyone could know that over four and a half billion years later. Well, with lots of cleverness. Let me explain. Certain nuclei produced in the R process are unstable. These isotopes undergo radioactive decay into lighter elements after being created in a neutron star collision. Now, the average decay time, or half-life, differs between different radioactive isotopes. Some decay faster than others. That means the relative abundance between any two isotopes should change over time. So, if you can measure the ratio in their abundance, then you know how long ago they were formed. There's actually one more complication. If you want to find the event date to within a reasonable degree of accuracy, then you need to look at isotopes with short half-lives. You want accuracy within millions of years, then the half-life should be measured in millions of years. But Earth is billions of years old. If Earth's R process elements were produced by a neutron star merger that happened before Earth formed, then any short-lived isotopes from that merger should have completely decayed by now. This is where the cleverness comes in. It turns out that the abundances of certain short-lived isotopes became locked into the very first minerals to form in our solar system. We found ancient meteorites that coalesced when the Earth was still forming. When they formed billions of years ago, they contained radioactive R process isotopes that themselves were formed in a nearby neutron star merger millions of years prior, and their ratios reflected that. Those rocks eventually found their ways to Earth and into the hands of scientists. These short-lived isotopes completely decayed long ago, but they decayed into other stable elements that were still locked in those meteorites. The abundances of these daughter products exactly reflect the abundances of the parents at the moment the meteorite material was formed. Now, this study focused on curium-247 with a half-life of 15.6 million years and compared it in ratio to plutonium-244 with its longer half-life of 80.8 .8 million years. Based on the relative abundance of their daughter products in meteorites, we know the relative abundance of these radioactive isotopes in the nebula that our solar system formed from. The researchers then did simulations to figure out how long ago and how far away the neutron star merger that formed these elements must have been. An important factor here is that neutron star mergers are rare. All short-lived R process isotopes are likely to have formed from the same merger. Because of this, they were able to identify a single neutron star merger 
that must have happened between 40 and 120 million years before the formation of the solar system and between 650 and 1300 light years away. That one event produced most of the short-lived R process elements that were present in the early solar system. More stable elements were built up over multiple neutron star mergers, which the researchers conclude must happen every 20 million years or so galaxy-wide. So what does all of this mean for the elements that make up the Earth and that make up you? Neutron star mergers are likely the dominant source of most elements with atomic masses 44 and up. That includes most of the lead, silver, gold, rare earth elements, and the radioactive stuff like uranium and plutonium. Also a good fraction of the molybdenum and iodine, which are essential for your biology. In fact, including the non-essential heavy elements, your body mass is something like two parts per million colliding neutron star material. That's only a tenth of a gram or so, but it's a pretty awesome tenth of a gram. It was, after all, synthesized on the rim of a black hole before surfing a wave of neutrinos into the nebula that would eventually collapse into our solar system. And those atoms would eventually find themselves part of a life form that would figure out the very time and distance of their formation, a collision of ancient stellar corpses in an earlier and distant space-time. Okay, last time we talked about the cosmic dark ages, that mysterious time before the first stars formed in our universe. Let's see what you had to say. Bloody Albatross reasonably asks, why is it called recombination? After all, weren't electrons combining with nuclei for the very first time? So why not just combination? Great question, Bloody Albatross. I think this is just a case of where a less than ideal name became common parlance, and now we're stuck with it. Corcorandum correctly infers that it should be possible to use the Lyman Alpha Forest to map where along the line of sight to a quasar there are clouds of hydrogen gas and learn about their size and density based on the shape of the absorption dip. Yep, you can actually do that. It's pretty crazy. And you can learn a lot about the large scale structure of the universe by looking at these quasars. Nolan Westrich summarizes my feelings on the matter. It's amazing how much scientists can find out with so little. In this case, from a single point of light that is that distant quasar. Jean-Peter Cornet asks something that I hoped one of you would. If the universe was transparent before recombination, when electrons were free of their atoms and so could block the paths of photons, then it was transparent during the dark ages because electrons bound in atoms don't block most of the light. But then after the universe was re-ionized, why didn't it become opaque again? Jan then goes on to answer that conundrum. It's because the universe after reionization was much larger than at recombination, like a factor of 100 at the beginning of reionization. And so electrons were more spread out. The density was 100 cubed times lower than at recombination. And so the mean free path of photons was a million times larger. In a related question, Lobby Seat Warmer asks, wouldn't the Dark Ages actually be blindingly bright given that the cosmic background radiation wasn't yet stretched to invisible microwave wavelengths? Actually, most of the Dark Ages would have actually been dark, at least to us. The Dark Ages started following recombination and then the cosmic background would still have been visible, red-orange everywhere, reflecting the 3000 Kelvin temperature at that time although even by then, most of the light was infrared. The universe then expanded by a factor of 100 over the next couple hundred million years, roughly linearly with time. So 10% of the way through that period, and the CMB would have redshifted to the far infrared and would no longer be visible to us, although we would have felt it on our skin. The temperature would have been a comfortable 300 Kelvin. And Spluff5 asks another related question. How dense was the gas just after recombination? Well, let's figure it out. The density of the universe is roughly one hydrogen atom per square meter. The universe is now around 1100 times larger than it was then. So can I do this in my head? There would have been 1100 hydrogen atoms per square meter. That's still incredibly diffuse but it's enough to stop photons moving very far, like only about a thousand light years. 
Now that sounds far, but it's nothing compared to the size of the universe even back then, so we still say that the universe was opaque. So at the end of the last episode, I commented that in Schrodinger's internet, Grumpy Cat both can and can't has cheeseburger. Uh, and then the next day, Grumpy Cat sadly passed away. Look, despite insinuations in the comments, I'm sure we didn't collapse Grumpy's wave function to can't has cheeseburger just by talking about it. Quantum mechanics forbids that. Anyway, I'm sure Grumpy is now in meme heaven, looking down on us disapprovingly alongside a certain noble gorilla. Rest in peace, Grumpy. Thank you.